Every contact leaves a trace. It's one of the most basic principles of forensic science. Whenever two surfaces come into contact, a transfer of material, no matter how slight, takes place. Every time a crime is committed, the perpetrator leaves something at the scene or takes it away. Tonight, we're going to examine two high-profile cases from the casebook that gripped the public's imagination and highlighted the importance of methodical evidence gathering. June the 28th, 1887, 6 a.m., and a young Jewish man sets off for work, leaving the door to his lodgings in 16 Batty Street unlocked. His pregnant wife, Miriam, is still in bed. Three and a half hours later, after Miriam fails to turn up for an appointment, worried friends go to 16 Batty Street. They find the door locked and batter it down. Inside, Miriam's lifeless body is found sprawled on the bed. A yellow frothy substance is dripping from her mouth. It looks like she's been poisoned. But to add to the horror, the body of a young man is discovered under the bed. He too has imbibed poison. But he's still alive. The man was Israel Lipsky, a 22-year-old Jewish immigrant from Warsaw. He lived in the attic above Miriam Angel. He decided to set up a workshop in his room and had hired two men to help, Isaac Schmus and Simon Rosenblum. Lipsky's walking stick workshop had been up and running for only a few hours when Miriam's murder took place. And one of the materials used in the making of walking sticks was nitric acid. This was the same substance discovered downstairs amongst the sheets in Miriam's bedroom. With the door to the room locked from the inside, the blame landed on the only person left alive inside, Israel Lipsky. Police came up with a theory. Lipsky had come to rob Miriam, forced her to drink the poison, and then, in a fit of remorse, decided to kill himself. It looked like an open and shut case. However, a number of basic errors were made at the scene. Gloves weren't used to handle a bottle of nitric acid. Lipsky's acid-stained jacket wasn't bagged, sealed, or photographed. And, most crucially of all, the lock wasn't examined or tested. Detective methods are really in their infancy at this time. Police have really got no sense of the importance of the crime scene or of maintaining the purity of the crime scene. In the Lipsky case, for example, the people have called the local doctor. So the local doctor's there trying to work out what's going on, and he's doing what we would now say is tampering with the evidence. At the London hospital, Lipsky was being treated for ingesting acid. By this time, the police had found a key witness, a man who claimed to have sold Lipsky the nitric acid. He said he'd sold one ounce of the acid to him and even remembered measuring it out. The witness was taken to the hospital where he positively identified him. Lipsky was charged with murder and moved to Newgate Jail, but he maintained his innocence. He claimed he'd left Batty Street at 8 a.m. to buy supplies, and when he returned, he'd been attacked by the two men he'd hired to work for him. The following account is from a statement he made at the time. I went upstairs to the first floor. I then saw both these men. They took hold of me by the throat and threw me to the ground. There on the ground, they opened my mouth and put in some poison. Then they threw me under the bed. And there I lay for dead. This account of events fell on deaf ears and Lipsky was sentenced to death. But in the minds of some, crucial evidence cast doubt on his guilt. 
Lipsky was treated for abrasions to his arms, wounds consistent with fending off a violent assault, backing up his statement. And curiously, the amounts of poison administered to Miriam and consumed by Lipsky did not add up. The witness claimed only to have sold Lipsky one ounce of nitric acid, but Miriam had been given two ounces and Lipsky one, a total of three ounces. So where did the rest of the poison come from? And what of the locked door? A door locked from the inside would seem to point to the murderer still being present at the scene. But further investigation found that this lock had recently been fitted. As this lock hadn't been adequately tested at the time, there was no way of telling if it was faulty or not. More importantly, Lipsky's employee, Rosenblum, was a locksmith by trade, and he couldn't account for his whereabouts on the morning of the murder. Then, a strange twist in the tale occurred. Lipsky confessed. He was hanged on the 22nd of August, 1887. Dr. Griffin, I need a bit of perspective on this. Why, at this stage of the proceedings, did Lipsky confess to the crime? I don't think we'll ever really know why Lipsky suddenly confesses to the crime. We've got a kind of transcript of the confession here, and to be honest, it just raises as many questions as it answers. It seems to be utterly inconsistent with everything that we know already. I mean, the confession says he bought the poison so that he was going to kill himself that day. But we know that he'd employed two men to set up a business, really, that morning. So why did he employ them and then decide to kill himself? I think we can probably discount the confession as a true account of what happened. It also comes straight after a length of time he's spent with his rabbi. We know that he's been spending hours holed up every day with his rabbi, this kind of spiritual relationship that's developing between the two of them. He's got no friends, family or support. He doesn't speak the language very well. So it's very likely that he would have been very susceptible to the impressions and the influences that this rabbi was having over him. So what's the rabbi's motivation? Why would he pressure Lipsky at this stage? Jews have been pouring into the east end of London for the last decade. They're pouring into very poor parts of the city and leading to overcrowding and pressure on jobs. And it's creating quite a lot of tension, really, this influx of immigrants. And we've got quite a lot of anti-Semitic reports in the newspapers as well. If we read this one from the evening news... We've got here, Polish Jews like Lipsky make their way over to London every year and in two generations work themselves up to small shopkeepers or even professions. But he carries on. They never lose their coarse, frizzly hair, flabby lips and large nose, little traits, small jealousies, huge vulgarity and love of gambling and overdressing. Oh. And that's in the newspapers. So the rabbi may well have felt it was a good way of diffusing some of the tension that this Lipsky case was really whipping up. So the real question is, did he do it or didn't he? I don't think we'll ever really be able to answer the question, did he do it or didn't they, because the police didn't collect the kind of evidence that would ever enable us to answer that question. I think what we can say very certainly, though, is Lipsky didn't get a fair trial. Over a hundred years later, the debate still rages on. But how would the case have been handled now? I've come to the University of Derby to speak with ex-Metropolitan Police crime scene officer and lecturer John Wright to see how a modern crime scene should be dealt with. OK, John, you've had 20 years' experience with the Met. Was the approach typical in the Lipsky case of the time? What they hadn't realised in the 1880s is that the crime scene was actually key to solving the crime. They weren't that concerned with scene preservation or, or worrying about what had actually happened at the crime scene. What they really should have done is place a cordon around the scene. What I've got here is some crime scene tape, mm -hmm. and that stops anybody entering the crime scene. Tell me the importance of this, what you're wearing. The idea of this is to protect me from the crime scene, so that if there's anything dangerous there, I'll be protected from it, and it also stops me contaminating the crime scene. What will you be looking for in this? What we've got here is a potential poisoning case, similar to the Lipsky case. We've got a dead male, and what we'll be looking for is Evidence that poisoning has occurred. Anything that could potentially contain poison that's been ingested. So when I enter the crime scene, I can use numbers just to mark off things that might be interesting to me later. I might be interested in the pills because they could potentially be a source of the poisoning. There's also some drink. Again, it could potentially be mm -hmm. the poison. If I step over the body, we've got the remains of a meal on the, on the side here. 
again, all these things could potentially have had poison in them that the, the body has, has consumed. Forensic science is a big jigsaw. It's all the little pieces that make up the whole. It may be suicide, it may be murder. We don't know at the moment. Explain to me what this test is down here. The silver paper is part of what we call an electrostatic lifting device, which we can use to lift any footmarks that may be on the floor. So I touch the, the wand to the edge of the, the foil and just increase the voltage, which sucks the foil down to the floor. Now hopefully when I lift it up, there'll be evidence of footmarks at the crime scene. Oh, uh, look at that, that's fantastic. If there was one golden rule about investigating a crime scene, what would you say it would be? I think the most important thing is to realise that you only really have one shot at a crime scene. So it's very important that you record and detail with photographs, sketches, notes, everything that's there, and bring back everything and anything that you feel could be important to the case. Because once we've looked at a crime scene, we can't go back again. Well, that's precisely what didn't happen in the Lipsky case. In the Lipsky case, lack of evidence gathering saw a potentially innocent man hanged in 1887. 20 years later, little had changed in forensic practices. In part two, a string of brutal and bizarre animal maimings leads to a major miscarriage of justice. A crime scene offers vital clues that can be key to catching the criminal. And there's a golden hour to survey it. It took detectives a long time to learn this lesson. Our next case shows how the mismanagement of a crime scene led to the intervention of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Great Worley is a quiet West Midlands town. But in the early 20th century, this mining area saw a grisly series of events that shocked the nation. Over the course of six months, a total of nine animals, horses and cows, were found in their fields, slashed across the stomach, cruelly left bleeding to death. But then, on August the 18th at 5.40am, a youth was making his way to work across a field near the Great Whirly Colliery. He came upon a bloody horse brutally slashed across the stomach. Police arrived and discovered blood smeared on the grass where the perpetrator had wiped his hands and clear footprints left in the mud. The crime scene wasn't closed off to the hundreds of miners who gathered to look and the police spent little time examining the area. They already had a suspect, George Adalji, a 27-year-old solicitor. George was a loner with bulging eyes who kept himself to himself. His father was the local vicar who'd come to the Midlands from India and married an English girl. Later that day, George was arrested. The police had little to go on, but with the maimings had come a series of anonymous letters, revelling in the details of the crimes and threatening that worse was to come. 
There will be merry times at Whirly in November when they start on the little girls, for they will do 20 wenches like horses before next March. The letters claim that George Adalji was the leader of an animal maiming gang. Roger Oldfield has been researching the case for nearly 30 years. This is the grave of George's father. Now, George's father was the vicar of this parish for 42 years, but he had a really unusual origin. He was actually the first Asian to become a vicar of an English parish, so he was a real pioneer. George was a product of a mixed marriage, so he looked Asian because of his father's heritage. He wasn't um, an oddity. He just seemed like an oddity because he was quiet and also because he looked different from anybody else who had ever lived in this area before. His appearance certainly did count against him, I think. Lots of people have tried to explain what went on in Great Worley in 1903, why there were outrages. There was uh, a story which one journalist told about people in the local pubs saying that there were things going on at the vicarage and there were nocturnal rites and there were sacrifices and that's why these animal outrages were taking place in Great Worley. The police had to take action. There was real concern, there was anxiety in the village. The newspapers all over the Midlands were covering it and eventually the national papers were covering it. They had to do something. On the 18th of August, George was arrested. The police then had to collect evidence to help convict him. At the vicarage, they discovered a pair of his boots, which were wet and stained with fresh black mud, and the house coat covered in horsehair. The evidence was handled in an appalling way. None of the items taken from the vicarage were sealed or labelled correctly. An officer was sent to the scene with George's boots to check the footprints matched up, potentially contaminating them. A strip of hide was cut from the dead horse to use as evidence, but this was carelessly put into the same bundle as George's clothes. The old house coat, which may or may not have contained horse hairs, was now found to have 29. In the trial that followed, the evidence against Adalji was circumstantial, but was still enough to convince the jury. George was sentenced to seven years in prison. In those days, there was no court of appeal. His case seemed hopeless, but the verdict led to a national outcry. George's race was held by many to be the motive behind this gross miscarriage of justice. In 1906, George was released from prison early. No explanation was offered by the authorities. But the case was still firmly in the public eye, and it caught the attention of one of the most famous men of the time, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Using the cunning methods of detection employed by his famous creation, Sherlock Holmes, Conan Doyle examined everything he possibly could. He set about debunking the police evidence. George's account of the evening before the maiming was that he went for a walk before supper. Conan Doyle noted that this accounted for the mud found on his boots, but crucially, he was able to see that this mud came from the road and was not the reddish mud from the fields around. George returned to the vicarage, had his supper, then went to bed in the room he'd shared with his father for 17 years. The police maintained Adalji had somehow sneaked out of the room without his father noticing and gone out under cover of darkness to commit the crime. Conan Doyle was convinced all this was fantasy. He'd trained as an eye surgeon and had noted Adalji had severe myopia. He'd have been half blind in full daylight and at night he'd have been completely helpless. Conan Doyle exposed not only the glaring holes in the case, but also the flaws in police methods. 
He noted how George's boots, a key piece of evidence, had been taken back to the crime scene and pressed into the soil. It was a very basic and very serious error. In 1907, Idalja received a grudging pardon from the Home Office, and he was able to go back to work as a solicitor, but they refused to grant him compensation for his wrongful imprisonment. However, Conan Doyle's work had some far-reaching effects. That same year, largely thanks to the Adalji case, a court of criminal appeal was at last established, meaning that those who were falsely imprisoned had at least some hope of justice. Bernard Spilsbury, the father of modern forensics, shared Conan Doyle's outrage at the methods employed by the police. And I'm with Andrew Rose, author of Lethal Witness, to find out more. And nobody knows more about Spilsbury than you do, Andrew. What was the case that motivated Spilsbury to do something? I think he'd be getting concerned about police methods, which were pretty sloppy in those days, for some years. But it was in 1924 that things came to a head in what was called the Crumbles murder, a case in which Emily Kay, a young woman, had been lured down to a bungalow by the seaside by a man called Patrick Marne, who'd murdered her and chopped her up into about a 1,000 pieces. And they were in the bungalow for about three weeks in rather a warm May. So by the time the police turned up, it wasn't perhaps the most savoury of experiences. And Spilsbury was appalled to discover the chief officer in the case, Superintendent Savage, was handling pieces of flesh with his bare hands. Of course, there's a risk of infection, but not only that, a risk of damaging valuable uh, forensic samples. They were remarkably sloppy. You can see photographs of police smoking as they examine scenes. They tramp over areas of uh, murder scenes with their boots before you know, footprints were recorded, things of that sort. It wasn't unusual. So Spilsbury was moved to advise the police to get their act together, and they set up what was called the murder bag. I think the term murder bag was probably coined by the tabloid journalists I'm of the day. I'm quite sure it was, yeah. But it was a step forward in detective work. So would that be the forerunner to what uh, detectives would take round to a crime scene today? Well, yes, it was the beginning of scenes of crime investigation. And it was Spilsbury, to his credit, who set the ball rolling. Spilsbury's contribution to forensic investigation is still in evidence today. Former scene of crime officer John Wright explains the importance of Spilsbury's development of the murder bag. The idea was to try and standardise the equipment that people took to crime scenes. So what he did was he put together a basic kit that everybody could take to a crime scene. It must have had a big impact. It's had time. a huge impact on, on the way things were done and it still has that impact now. And uh, what would a murder bag then have contained? The murder bag contained some fairly simple items, a ruler for measuring, Things like forceps, scalpels, scissors for collecting objects, mm -hmm. gloves to protect the hands and to stop you damaging objects, some bags to put the evidence in. In what way is the modern murder bag different? What we've got here is a typical example of, of one of the kits that one of our students would use. And although we fu have fundamentally the same sort of things in there, we have a lot more. We've got swabs for taking samples. We have sample containers for packaging liquids, more sophisticated measuring devices and also chemical tests, which we can do now at crime scenes, which they couldn't do in the 1920s. We've actually got fingerprint powder in here, so we can take fingerprints. Our bags are much more sophisticated than the paper bags that spills we used to have. But you do have the magnifying glass. But we still have magnifying glass. Spillsbury's revolutionary techniques earned him a name as the father of modern forensics. Had his ideas been implemented earlier, could two miscarriages of justice been avoided? The crime scene is still the single most important place to gather clues. Most crimes can be solved by processing the trace evidence. Not doing so correctly can have devastating consequences.